Hi, this is Stu Tinker from SK Tours in Derry, Maine, and I'm listening to the Stephen King Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest episode of the Stephen King Podcast. It's Valentine's Day when we are recording this, uh, and so I don't know when you're going to hear it, but I hope you had a great Valentine's Day with your loved ones and family. And as, as usual, I'm here with my co-host, Hans. Happy Valentine's Day, Hans. Thank you. I'm uh, delighted to spend it with you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just don't tell our wives. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So this one's going to be, uh, we've got quite a bit of news and we're going to revisit The Stand since that's the next book on the list from the Stephen King Revisited site. And part of that was Hans and I both rewatched the miniseries, which I hadn't done in quite a long time. So that was very interesting. And yes. we'll get to all that fun stand stuff. But first, as usual, we have the news. Welcome, welcome. Do not fear the door that lies before you. We will protect you. We are your guides, Hans and Lou, and we will give you the latest in Stephen King news. But before we do so, you must prove yourself worthy. You must open the door and join us in the death room. The first news today is that Stephen King is not dead. <laughs> and that might sound like a strange news. But in late January, there were some rumors online uh, that he had actually died. Hmm. So, And, and I, I actually didn't hear these, uh, these rumors. What caught my eye was that, on, I think it was on, on his Facebook page, he added uh, a little note that said, we've added a new Q&A to the uh, F F F FAQ. Question, are you dead? Answer, <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit this whole thing blew by before I even heard about it. So in fact, until you posted it on your site, I had not I had missed all the whatever waves this had caused. But I don't think it was a, a, a lot of consternation about this. It seems like he nipped it in the bud pretty quickly. So I think that's part of the reason why it didn't really make, like there was no big news items uh, retracting the statement about King being dead or not. Yeah, and I think I think it just it, it surfaced on on one or two pages, and it, it didn't really uh, take hold in the big news pages. So I think they it didn't spread that way. So yeah, which is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> and I'm glad King. It would be really cool if he actually tweeted and said, "I am, but I'm still here." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyhow. All right. Uh, so yep. next item, we're back with the Broadway version of Some Misery. And Stephen King actually attended a showing and he went backstage and talked to the stars, Laurie Metcalf and Bruce Willis. And, you know, I, I had mentioned, I think, in a previous podcast that I didn't really know who Laurie Metcalf was. But then I, once I saw her, I realized that she played she was on the Roseanne series and she was uh, Roseanne's sister for for that series. So uh, I knew her quite well, actually. So I could see her playing a good uh, Annie. And Stephen King basically said that. It, uh, there was also a, a video that went up later on. And it was kind of funny how Laurie Metcalf was just talking like a mile a minute and Bruce Willis didn't say a word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> he just smiled and chuckled a bit, but he didn't really say anything. King seems to have enjoyed the, the play. And he said that they both give uh, good versions of the character, which seems to go in line with some feedback that you got from one of our viewers. Exactly. Some time ago, we mentioned that we, we got get a re review from someone who saw a preview show of this, who didn't like it at all. And after that, a gentleman called Lance Gray contacted me and mentioned that he had seen it uh, actually three weeks into the run of it. And he, he liked it a lot and thought that they did the parts well and the setting was great and everything. And the funny thing is that I we talked, uh, we misunderstood each other a little bit. So the next podcast after that, I didn't mention this because I was waiting for feedback from him and he 
was waiting for me to say something on the, on the podcast. <laughs> um, so then after that, we reconnected again. And for the podcast after that, I couldn't find his original message. So I had to make an uh, announcement in the last podcast to ask for him. So he contacted me again and sent me this info. So now now I'm doing this this lance so i hope i hope you forgive me for my mistakes earlier but anyway he said he he liked it as well and afterwards he actually met both laurie and bruce who, who was very kind and signed stuff for them and a lot of fans really wanted to hear bruce uh, say his famous line from die hard yippee ki <laughs> uh, and so on <laughs> yeah and so on <laughs> So it seems like uh, they got it together and maybe the first uh, review we read was from the preview before they had it all set in and gotten warm in their parts. It's, it's, it seems like it, it took off and, and was really good. And, and we saw some photos from it later uh, on the, from the setting and even from, from the show itself. And it looked really good. And uh, they, they did a trailer for it where you, where you saw the actors in, in action. And from that, it also looked good. So maybe we were too harsh on it from the beginning. Well, we can only relay what we've been hearing from other people. So it's good to get yeah, exactly. a, a more, the broader the base of the responses we get, the, the better picture we can get of it. So, yeah, I mean, they're both good actors and I would love to be able to see this play. So, yeah, um, but yeah. I wish they, they could. Levy. Yeah, I got some hope when they had filmed, actually filmed some of it to do this, this trailer that yeah. popped up online. But I don't know if they're going to shut it all, so they're going to release it in some form. And I don't know, but that, that would be great if they did. Yeah, it would be cool if down the road, live theater would do some sort of streaming or pay-to-play kind of option. Yeah. I can yeah. understand why they just don't want to release videos outright. Otherwise, people will just say, well, I can just wait for them to put it on video, and then I don't have to pay to go to the show. But if you know if they yeah. charge yeah. something for it, a couple of bucks, four or five bucks, I'd be more than happy to to stream it or get a be able to download a digital copy of it or something like that but yeah uh, definitely and i that, mean that would be it's, cool it's ne- yeah and it's never the same to, to just watch it on, on your tv at home as seeing it live Ab- so absolutely yeah i don't think as, as long as the, they don't release it at the same time i don't think it would be uh, comp- competing with each other so yeah yeah but we were hoping that for the ghost brothers as well and that didn't happen so yeah. i guess we'll see yeah next item is poor cell has still has no signal or carrier. No, it was no. supposed to premiere at a Scottish horror film festival, but they just posted a, a notice back on January 27th that due to circumstances beyond our control, we have had to draw withdraw cell from the 6:30 p.m. slot on Friday, February 26th. If you were looking forward to see this in particular, we are sorry. There was definitely not, absolutely nothing we could do about it, and believe us, we tried. So, yeah, what, what can you say? I mean, it's, it's just strange. It's, it's very strange. And unless there's maybe there was a deal in the works that prohibited any screenings of it. But it's weird that they don't want to start building up some form of buzz or traction for this before, before yeah. uh, if it ever does get released. Because it's been on the shelf so long, the longer it sits mm. there, the more our opinions of its chances of being any good are continuing to plummet. So yeah, uh, yeah it's and, too bad. And I mean, the, the zombie bus is, it's not as strong as it was like a year ago. And I think it's going a bit downhill now uh, mm. as well. Yeah. A little uh, oversaturated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The good, the good thing about it is though, that they released two new photos from it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but what worries me about this is, now we have seen these two new photos and we have seen one older photos. And on all three of those, the, there are three people just standing around. <laughs> I mean, and they're not going to give away photo, the goods. <laughs> no, but they could at least give us some photo of some something blood? else. Than, you want some blood? Yeah, or, or something else <laughs> or than, gore. than three people standing around. I mean, they, they have to do something else in the movie, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it could show them in a the car or something. It's almost like they are all three of the same photos, just in yeah. different places. So it's not that exciting photos. I, I mean, if they want to build excitement for the movie, they maybe they should have released another photos. Yeah. yeah. So I guess we'll see if, if this, but it, it's, it's strange. It's very strange. I mean, it's definitely not making any money for any, anyone sitting on a shelf. So yep. let's get it out there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and the next item is, I guess it's both good or bad, depending on how you look at it. Mm-hmm. The revival 
or the revival, the, the book is being turned into a movie by none other than Josh Boone, who we have heard a lot about before. The bad thing about this is that the stand is being put on hold for revival. Mm -hmm. And I guess in the statement that was made is that they wanted to get the stand more ready to be filmed, and in the meantime, Boone is doing revival. To me, it sounds a little bit... First Lisey's story, then Stand, then Revival. It's a little bit worrying that all these titles are announced, but then nothing happens with them. But I guess we'll see what happens. Personally, I would prefer the Stand over Revival. I think most people would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because of, and, especially since Revival is such a downer ending to the story. <laughs> yeah, well, I like those downer endings. Also, Samuel L. Jackson has been cast for a part in Revival, and he w would be playing, if this is true, we don't know if this is true or just a rumor so far, but he would play the Reverend Charles Jacobs. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's just a rumor, and Samuel L. Jackson is just one of those actors that seems to show up almost in every picture. I mean, between him and Michael Caine, I think they have all the supporting roles. <laughs> but this this would be, um, and this is in a way a supporting role because this character keeps popping in and out of the main character's life. Interesting choice. Again, you know, uh, this is, if, if we wanted to, you could really wait in and make this a touchy subject because he's not the right, <laughs> he's not the character that we know from the book. Oh. But uh, and then we're going to get into that in the, when we do our revisited of the stand as well, because the character, the actor that played Flag, is also not the character that we had in mind. So oh. I'm a mixed mind. I mean, the guy's the guy's a good actor, but I do have to say that I'm a little fatigued of Samuel L. Jackson and and just in general because he's been in so many movies lately. So I think he would do a good job, but I don't know. I. I would like to see somebody else in this role, to be honest. And it doesn't particularly have to be of a particular ethnic makeup or anything like that. I, I just, I would just like something, somebody more, somebody that I'm not as a little tired of seeing, I guess is the best way to put yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was thinking a little bit, bit more like someone that looked more like, if you're familiar with the Simpsons, uh, the Burns character. <laughs> I was, I was seeing more of something like that in front of me when I, when I read the book, and uh, that's definitely not Samuel L. Jackson. So yeah. uh, he's not the person I, I envisioned when I read the book. Yeah. But I, I think he could pull it off, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and... I think he could too, but I, I think like what you, I agree with what you're saying. I, I would just like something a little more creative if it's whoever yeah. gets cast this role, somebody that's going to make you go, whoa, I, I never saw that. You know, like somebody like maybe a Tom Hardy or um... – and uh, what's his name, Eddie Romaine, or like a Ben, is it Ben Olson? I believe like some some of these other actors that could really surprise you or say, wow, that's that's an interesting choice for that character. So Samuel Jackson is a good choice, but he's also to me he's a bit of a safe choice. Yeah, and I just would see too much of Nick Fury <laughs> from the Avengers <laughs> movies right now, um, and that's part of the problem I have with overexposure with this guy. So, but. Yeah. I also, like you, I'm a little concerned now that Josh Boone has put the stand on the back burner. I understand maybe the part of the problem here is that the option with Warner Brothers has come and gone. And I think Warner Brothers has really got its focus on making, uh, wondering what their, is going to happen with their superhero franchise. Like they've put, a, they've sunk a lot of money into that Batman versus Superman movie. Yeah. And depending on who you talk to, the reactions to it so far are not what they, what they were hoping for or expecting. So maybe they're worried that they're going to be taking a bath on this movie because they want to use that movie to launch their whole DC comic line with Justice League and all that. So unfortunately, they might be a little nervous right now. And because of that, basically, that's put this project on hold. But every time that happens, like you said... It makes me nervous that the momentum that was there before is not going to be recovered. Or, or new people, if like say if Batman versus Superman bombs, everybody that, that's warmers, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs, right? So then a whole new bunch mm -hmm. of people are going to come in and then you have to start all over again getting them interested in the stand. And if they just lost a ton of money on this one movie, it might affect their – they might be more risk averse with because the, the stand is risky to make as a yeah. movie series. And But on the other hand, I, I kind of like the idea that Josh Boone would get his feet wet with a smaller Stephen King story. I, I would yeah. like to see how he can handle that and then use that experience as a springboard to doing something but so much more epic like the stand. So I'm, I'm mixed feelings about it, but generally I'm worried that the stand might never – 
come to fruition because of this. Yeah, and I and I and I get the feeling that, uh, and, and no matter uh, what the reason is that it, the stand is put on hold, that when you when you are attached to movies and again and again they are getting pulled back or or on hold or something. You have a hard time believing that revival will actually happen now as well because it, previous two have, have been pulled back. So yeah. I guess we'll have to, have to wait and see. Yeah. All right. But turning to something that we know is coming out for sure, and actually yes. it's premiering tomorrow night on February 15th in the States. That is, of course, 112263. And if you go to Han's site, you can see a pretty cool poster. It's a window pane that looks like a bullet hole through it and you can see James Franco in his Clark Kent suit <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a reporter with that hat on yeah Clark Kent yeah he's running <laughs> so with this and then another cool thing that uh, you posted was the title sequence for the, for the series which I thought yeah. was really cool with um, like the laser the laser beam trajectories of the shots from the rifle and stuff like that so there's, there's a lot of cool stuff up there in general the early reviews i've been hearing are pretty positive and i guess we do have to be prepared to recognize or accept the fact that the adaptation of the series is not going to be exactly what we read in the book but it still captures the core of the book which is always the main thing so i'm really looking forward to seeing this tomorrow night i haven't seen it yet I'm curious if you have any thoughts that you want to add about this, Hans. Yeah, well, uh, first, I think that the laser beam you mentioned in, in the uh, intro open, uh, or opening titles are actually strings, red strings that tie things together. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, and I must say that I have seen this show, as you know by now. Mm -hmm. And when, when I turned on the first episode and I saw this intro, it really warmed my heart because I, I, the intro is super nice, I think. Uh, okay. And I, f I felt very happy when I saw that. And uh, I liked the rest as well. So, And I guess I can say that now because it's been posted on some places and uh, on Stephen King's message board as well that there are some changes compared to, to the, the book. Mm -hmm. And I understand why, why they have done them, and I think most of them are actually good. Okay. So I think if you are looking for something that are follow the book exactly, there are some things that will maybe disappoint you if, if you want it exactly as the book. But I think they have good reasons for doing the changes they do. So personally, I think they work. So. Cool. Yeah. I mean, and when you have, anytime you have to adapt a book that's like, I don't know what it was, 800 pages or something into eight hours, yeah. you, there has to be compression. And we will, of course, be reviewing this episode, this series, uh, but not episode by episode. But our next podcast will probably be in two weeks. Actually, we're scheduled to do a guest appearance on another podcast. Yeah. Books versus movies, and we're going to talk about the comparison of the two. I'll be a little a bit of a, at a handicap because the, the series won't be done at that point. But Hans will have to. Uh... No, I think I think I think we will only talk about the first two episodes because okay. uh, the hosts of the other show haven't won't have seen more than you have. So. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, yes, yeah, so right. we're only talking about the first two episodes, and from that, Lou and I will review the the rest, the other six episodes. Right. Not each week, but but as. I imagine that you'll put up a link for the when they post their podcast because we're guesting on their podcast. Yes. It won't be ours. That, so we won't have another podcast out probably for a month, I, I would think. Yeah. So, But don't worry. We will talk about this series and you can hear it at a books versus movie podcast. Yes. And we can also mention that happily this show has been sold all around the world. And we know some dates that as we as you mentioned the US date is February 15th for the first episode Australia will be following the, the February 16 Canada February 17 New Zealand February 23rd and Germany April 11 and other countries that has it has is it's been bought by Fox Networks so if you have that one in your in your country you will definitely see this one and the the countries that's been confirmed but has no date are the UK Italy Russia Netherlands Spain Sweden Bulgaria Belgium Croatia Finland Greece Hungary Norway Poland Portugal Serbia and Slovenia so it will be moving around Europe as well uh, this spring. Awesome. Yes. But you would, in this day, digital age, I understand that there's rights issues in that, but really it doesn't make sense to have these staggered releases. They're just hurting themselves. They should really release it everywhere at the same time. But, yeah. you know, 
Yeah. That, that's that's a business model constraint that content providers are still trying to work around. But, well, I'm just glad that everybody's going to get a chance to see it eventually uh, one way or the other. Yeah. All right. One more item, Hans. Take it away. Yes. It's a biggie. Exactly. This is uh, the Dark Tower movie. And as we've been reported earlier, there's been Idris Elba has been rumored. Matthew McConaughey has been rumored. And in a recently interview in Rolling Stones, King himself talked about this movie. And he said that it he didn't really know, but he said that to him it was more likely that it would happen than that it wouldn't. And the same goes for Idris Elba and Matthew McConaughey. He thought that it was a bigger chance that they would be in the movie than that they wouldn't be in the movie. So straight from King, probably this movie will happen and it will star Idris Elba as Roland and Matthew McConaughey as Flag, as it looks now. Things can happen in Hollywood, we know that. But if, if anyone would know, it would be Stephen King. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, he basically... Didn't com- he didn't, sorry. Basically, he didn't... Com- <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. He, he, didn't co- he didn't confirm this, but he's, he said that it was more likely to happen than not. So I guess, I guess that is as close to a confirmation that he can give until it's publicly announced. Right. But that... And I'm sorry, I, I broke you up there twice. But the, the main thing is that we now know that there was not just smoke. There was actually some fire to those rumors. So yeah. that's good. And we've, of course, talked about this ad nauseum. So we're not going to go back over this ground again. But No, but, but what I think we should talk about is what do you think about Matthew McConaughey as flag? We haven't spoken much about that. I think that's inspired. And you see, like I was thinking when we were talking about revival, I... I would like to see McConaughey play the priest in that. But if he's playing a flag in this move for a series, you don't want him playing. Well, I guess you could, he could play the priest in Revival, too. That that would like to me, that's the kind of casting I would like to see. I mean, we've already had Jamie Sheridan play flag, and he's also a white guy. So <laughs> it yeah, obviously, yeah, it obviously uh-huh. can work. <laughs> uh, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's interesting to see someone who at least mostly play, plays good the good guy. Yep. play the bad guy yeah and if done right it could be very effectful because yep. you you're not used to see this actor playing a, a bad guy so i think that could be very effectful yeah i think also that he might look too kind i'm i'm when i'm envisioning flag i see someone that looks not very evil because he is a little secretive but some something something more evil over him than than i see in makani that could be handled with some makeup or stuff like that, maybe. But well, I think it could work. But I think I was I, I was expecting someone to, who look a little bit ev- more evil. That's why I like the choice because he does look friendly, but yeah. if he's able to convey that underneath the surface, there's really something twisted about him. I think that makes for it's kind of like the first time you see Hannibal in the Silence of the Lambs because they yeah. build they build up all this. This guy's a cannibal and he kills all these people. So you're expecting to see like a raving lunatic in a straitjacket. And then when you see the guy, he's just like an English butler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which makes it which makes it even creepier, right? So if, yeah, if McConaughey true. can pull something off like that, I think that would be awesome. And I still go yeah. back to my idea that I would love to see the movie open with Idris Elba starting off as Randall Flagg. And then when he sees Roland come back and sees that it's, you know, it's Idris Elba. And he would say, oh, that's how it's going to be this time. And then he snaps his fingers and turns into Matthew McConaughey. I think that would be awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of like um, the beginning of Star Trek, too, with Spock. When Kirk said to Spock, he says, aren't you aren't you dead? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) because people were always complaining ahead of time before the movie. The rumor got out that Spock was going to die in that movie. Right. So they have addressed it. and the same thing that on Her Majesty's Secret Service, when uh, George Lazenby played James Bond and the girl beat him up or something like that or got or turned him down, he says, that's never that never happens to the other guys. <laughs> <laughs> like you just got to embrace it and t- makes, uh, have some fun with it. And hope you want yeah. to break the ice, the audience will go along with it. But so that, that, that's a lot of interesting news there. But he also said some interesting stuff about Jericho Hill. Yeah, exactly. He, he says that he, he will never be done with the Dark Tower. And I believe him. I think that even though we have a start, we have a, an ending to, this, to the story. We will st- still get some stories that happens in between, like we did with Wind Through the Keyhole. And one of the things you want to write about is uh, Jericho Hill uh, right. events. Yeah. yeah. And also, he, he's, he, he, yeah, and he sees like uh, all the first books were, were first drafts. So you want to go back and, and redo them. So 
but I, I, th- I think that might be stretching it a little bit, depending on how much he changes. But I think it, it would. I think that investing that much work in just touching them a little bit, tuning them up a little bit, it would be a lot of work for mm-hmm. seven books to do all that and yeah. just have them change a little bit. So if I could choose, I would rather see him writing new books than tuning up the Dark Tower books over yeah. again. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Sometimes the it's the, the the flaws in a work actually make you love it more. Like you, if it's like with a yeah. person, right, and you, you love them, they have certain things that drive you crazy, but you still love them in spite of that. So I, I think... I think this is. I think it's more of a a wish list item for him than a, something that he'll actually do. But I don't yeah, know. The guy yeah. surprised us before. But it, like yeah. you, I I would love to see the whole thing about Jericho Hill because we've never we've never seen or heard directly what happened to the original Cotet except through this kind of like well there was this battle. But we'd like to. Yeah. I'd like to actually see that. We've never seen Roland with his entire previous Cotet. It's been one or character or the other, but never the whole group. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think he addressed it somewhat in in the comics. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, but, um, yeah. yeah, I think I w- would prefer to have it as a book. Yeah, and uh, especially if, if he doesn't pick up the horn of Eld, that would be make the ending resonate more too. But the, I mean, yeah. because he does it here, doesn't mean they would include it in the miniseries. But it would be a nice uh, Easter egg for later on. The other interesting th- item about this piece is that he's says he's in between books <laughs> which yes which sounds like <laughs> what you can't be in between books <laughs> get back he's to always work. writing books <laughs> that's right <laughs> so I, I don't know if he's being coy this year because the only thing we've got announced is uh, end of watch coming out in june but yeah. the streak of two books a year could potentially be broken this year but i'm crossing my fingers that he's being coy and then we're going to hear an announcement about something coming out in November still. Yeah, and I think I think it's been posted on his message board that he's been working on stuff mm-hmm. uh, previous. So I think I think there's a book lying around just waiting for this. <laughs> a trunk I don't novel? Think it... <laughs> Sorry? Another trunk novel? <laughs> yeah, or, or something he's written that that is just have to finish up or something like that. Or maybe it's even finished. Yeah. I don't think he's all tapped out and and waiting, I, I just can't see it. I think he has more lying I around. I hope so. I'd like to see his streak keep going, at least for another yeah. year, too. Yeah, All right. definitely. So that is the news. Yes. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> All right. This is great. What's our job? We'd like to drive around, pick up stiffs or what? It's time for reviews from The Night Shift. So, The Stand as a miniseries. Uh, this one... Uh, was, was done for TV uh, and aired in four episodes back in 1994. Take that, you um, people that say The Stand can't be done in four movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually, these are like four movies because each yep. episode is like uh, one and a half hour hour long. Yep. So the whole thing is, is almost six hours. Uh, and that's not counting the commercials because I think each episode was two hours when they aired on TV because yeah. they had put in all these commercials yeah. uh, but it's like six hours and uh, <clears throat> we get we they take their time to develop the characters and and everything and I think this this is a good adaptation it definitely is mm-hmm. um, when you see it like now what is it 22 years yep uh, after it's done, uh, Hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I, rem- I remember this one when it aired in in Sweden on on a paper uh, a channel we had to pay for yep. watching, and I didn't have that channel, but oh. a, a coworker of my mother's had it, oh. so I had to convince my mother to convince her coworkers to tape it for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you but were, she did. She you did. Were she a did. So I, yeah. Yep. So she got did. It on so beta. I get it. Yeah. 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 So, and I remember when I saw it, I loved it when I saw it back then. Sure. And I, when we rewatched it now for for this episode, I still liked it. Um, Yep. There was some stuff that felt very old. Sure. Um, There was some stuff in it that that felt very strange, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. We can go into that, those later on. Sure. Uh, but I think it's it's built in a good way. You, you move the story in, in segments. You get to know the stories. They travel. 
you have the battle on the ending and and stuff like that. So I think it's well constructed and had a good story. And I, it's really its only problem is that it's it's hasn't aged as good as you might have wished. And uh, some of the characters might have been different differently cast uh, mm-hmm. if it were done today. I think. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know. I think the the hair hairstyle that uh, Flag has, I think it's called mallet or something in English. Mullet. English? mullet. Yeah, mullet. Uh, here in Sweden, it's called uh, hockey frilla. <laughs> that's translated to uh, because earlier the the hockey players from from uh, like Czechoslovakia and stuff like that had very long hair right. in the back. Right. So it's it's translated to hockey hairdo or something uh-huh. like that, and. I think it's it looks kind of geeky on him, so I, I guess he could it could have been done a bit different. But I guess in 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 mid nineties that what was cool by then, that uh, standard. Uh, but overall, I, I actually enjoyed it, uh, and uh, I think I, I'm happy that they took the time and did it right. Yes, uh, it's it's the way that uh, say under the dome should have been done. Mm-hmm. Uh, four long episodes. Uh, would have been so much better. Yep. yep. What What are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I, I haven't watched this, and I cannot honestly remember how long. But uh, watching it again, uh, it was a very curious thing because we've become so used to CGI um, being used uh, in the bulk of uh, special effects shots and whatnot. And while there's definitely a couple of shots where CGI would have been really welcome, overall, the sh- because it was mostly practical effects, there's a um, organ a, a really organic raw kind of feeling to it. It's almost like an indie picture in some ways that I actually really liked. It it felt more real because of that. Um, but the problem is where they really needed the CGI. It really it's really apparent that they need it and it kind of falls <laughs> apart, especially like in the climax. But overall, yeah. you know, there's um, certain performances that really bothered me before, like especially uh, Molly Ringwald as Franny Goldsmith. Uh, she didn't bother me nearly as much this time. I was actually more okay with her uh, than I have ever been. Um, and overall, I, th- I, th- I really did like a lot of the casting here. The only... And I don't really think it's a miscasting, but I, I just think it's the way the character was handled was the, um, the Harold Lauder character. Um, because in the book, he starts out like this really geeky, uh, nerdy, uh, clumsy guy. But by the yeah. time he, we get to you know his, um, his final chapters, the, he's become quite the, well, I wouldn't, don't want to say the, a stud, but he's, he's really been able to put on a different persona to his character that uh, everybody treats him like, uh, you know, like he's a, a big gun kind of guy. And that never comes across in the miniseries. He starts out as a nerd and his complexion clears up, but that's basically, basically it. He's still walking around with the glasses and the, and the greased back down hair. So yeah. that's kind of disappointing um, because he's such an important character in the story uh, and he triggers such strong uh, actions that I, I really wanted that character to have a better arc than what was captured in, in the miniseries. Um, and, you know, you, you watch this and you you see all the other adaptations Mick Garris has done, and it's like it's two different people. Um, from this one, like, he just really does a lot of good things um, and really captured the the heart of the book and does some really good shots like a, the shot of Harold when he hits the railing and goes flying over like that's a really good shot you know like it's yeah. it's well yeah. staged um and some of the shots of the characters walking with the mountains in the background some really great shots uh um and just some of the um you know the, his camera moves and whatnot uh uh, it's when you look at this and compare it to all the other things that he's done for uh, King adaptations, it's really hard to reconcile where, where he went <laughs> <laughs> after this. And, and it, you always feel kind of bad because he seems like a super nice guy. Um, but yeah, whatever was happening and maybe this is something that we should really be excited about is you could say, well, if a director like Mick Garris, um, who's 
other works aren't, you know, looked on as well as this one. If he could do such a really good job with this property in today's world with so many great directors out there looking to adapt these things that this, whoever gets to adapt this story, um, they can probably really do an, an amazing job with it. And the one sequence that really, really disappointed me is the Lincoln Tunnel sequence. That didn't go on nearly long enough and it wasn't nearly scary no. enough. Um, so that's kind of my quick impressions. <laughs> There's lots of things that we could talk <laughs> about, but um, uh, I, I don't know if we just want to sort of talk about the actors and then the story um, or, or however you want to do it. But uh, uh, whatever interests you, uh, I'm, I'm quite willing to talk about. And we'll try to weave in the Stephen King revisited columns that were done. And they're really good ones for this one because we have uh, – Bev Vincent, as usual, does a great uh, context of, uh, you know, King's struggles to uh, get this novel written. And then um, Richard Chismar for Cemetery Dance talks about about it and sort of segues into, you know, because he's a friend of Josh Boone, who we talked about at the top of the episode, who's uh, attached to direct this, uh, The Stand. And yep. he has a great column, too. So... Uh, we'll try to weave all out, that all in, but uh, what would you like to talk about first, Hans? Well, we, we could we could start about the revisited because I think there's uh, some uh, some things that that are interesting to talk about there. Okay. Uh, for one thing is that when when uh, Josh Boone wrote, wrote this uh, or his essay essay there, he ends with saying that he hasn't re- read the revival yet, and now he's slated to direct it so that's interesting <laughs> i guess he really liked it <laughs> yeah he must have um and uh, rich mentioned also that he uh, that josh has turned in a script that is rumored to be excellent and he indicates that he might have read it and liked it uh and he um uh, well, he mentioned this the casting for the the stand uh, will be Surprising, right. uh, so that's make make me wonder has has there been uh, casting done? Yeah. Uh, and he he mentioned that between the, the characters he would like to see more about is either Stu Redman or or Franny Goldsmith, and he has on good authority that one day we will learn more about them. Mm. So mm-hmm, I guess that that has to come from King himself that he has an interest in. Uh, visiting these characters again, mm. uh, so it's uh, it's uh, some very interesting uh, statement he he makes in that in that uh, yeah. article he's published. Yeah, unfortunately, because the option has lapsed with Warner Brother, whatever casting they might have had in place has probably gone up uh, in smoke, and they'll have to, have to start over again as well. So we have to bear that in mind too. Yeah, and and uh, it, it I wish that they would. When when stuff like that happened, I guess I wish they would publish who they ha- had in mind or who was contacted. It would be so in- interesting to see how they thought about it. Yeah, uh, I, I think they mostly it just disappears. Yeah, I think they're not allowed to do that because the actors are obviously uh, and the production companies are um, <clears throat> don't want to, you know, put out. Um, alerts to other movie companies to whatnot say oh if we want to get this guy we're gonna to have to you know up our bid against what they're offering that person right now so um, yeah. yes. so there's a, like a confidentiality um, you, you want to work under the covers as much as possible because we saw what happened with Sony when they had those email leaks how it all kind of it really blew up on their faces but um, yeah yeah there's some interesting stuff in that uh, in Richard's column and uh, well all three actually um, and when you you know, the most heartening thing, because uh, I was really high on Josh Boone when he did that podcast uh, interview with uh, Kevin Smith, is if you look at all the books he's read <laughs> from Stephen yeah. King, like there's, you know, he's <laughs> he's hit all the big ones. So this this guy knows or is very familiar with Stephen King. But like you, I'd love to see his treatment of the stand script to see what he has in mind. Uh, so, yeah. yeah so well, one day maybe. Stuff. But, maybe, yeah. yeah. But back to this one. Um the things I had some problem problems with was uh, for one the military. Uh, I think it was uh, quite exaggerated, um, and and one thing that I reacted to especially was that 
uh, when I think it was uh, if it was the brother or something something to one of the guys at the gas station, yeah. uh, the sheriff that came, yeah. and when he calls back to the headquarters, um, he talks to the receptionist, and afterwards we see these three military guys standing there with guns yeah. <laughs> and, well, and watching you know. this one lady, and it it felt a little exaggerated, and uh, yeah, uh, it it just felt phony, I think. Uh, well, the way you know. they invaded the, the community and uh, uh, they, I, I remember one uh, military car came in through the town and, and this guy was hanging out the window with a machine gun <laughs> like he was going into battle. And I yeah. mean, it, it, it felt a little bit exaggerated. Uh, I yeah, think. yeah. It's, well, I think sometimes they did exaggerate it just to make a shortcut to tell people, you know, this is serious stuff going on here. Yeah. Um, I, I think what I had, my, you know, one of the dated aspects of the, uh, more dated aspects of this uh, miniseries was some of the dialogue was really on the nose. And I, part of the problem, I guess, with like a large cast like this, you constantly have to remind people who's who's who. So, but... It just doesn't sound natural when people keep seeing people's names all the time. <laughs> like, yeah. you, know, you don't, you know, they don't talk, people don't talk like that when they're talking to somebody. They don't say, well, Stu Redman, I think you should do this. You just say, yeah. you should do this, you know, like that's how people talk. So, but I understand, yeah. but it, it was a little awkward. Uh, but I think people, you know, audiences are more sophisticated nowadays. So that, that probably would be done a lot better. Um, and, you know, uh, I have to say, uh, one of the this has got one of the best openings to a Stephen King adaptation. I, it, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff above ground is not quite as, as slick, but the whole uh, "Don't fear the Reaper" and the, and the camera pans yeah. through the yeah. underground base um, that is just uh, really fantastic. And and you can tell what, how it's dated when the camera is pulling in to the guardhouse and it goes to the TV camera uh, to show the underground base with nowadays with CGI that, that transition from that, that camera to the camera that's actually in the base would be basically seamless. It would go right through the screen of the, of the TV when you wouldn't even notice it. Right. But, and here you yeah. can see it's kind of a, a slightly different angle shot, but you know, that's a technical limitation on that. And, uh, but that, that opening sequence with all those uh, pe dead people down on the underground base. I, I, it's one, it's one of my favorite uh, openings to a Stephen King movie period. I, I just think it's really well done and the music is great. And in general, the music uh, for the whole movie, uh, I think it's like Ry Cooter guitar stuff. It, it really works uh, quite well. Yeah, I agree. I love that song. Don't yeah. fear the reapers. So yeah. it's perfect. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, well, another thing that I, I, and I have to confess that I haven't read the book in a really long time, so maybe I'm missing something here. But okay. when when the three when the three of them leave for Las Vegas, Las Vegas, uh, Stu, uh, Larry, and Glenn, Glenn, exactly. Um, I didn't really understand why they did that, because they they arrived, they got captured, and the uh, trash can man came with a bomb, mm -hmm. and. I, I didn't really get what why they were going there. Uh, and I, I guess it's, in the book it might be different because I, I can't remember exactly how it was in the book. Yeah, uh, well, Glenn Bateman goes into it more. Uh, he went into it a little detail about the fact that they're walking and, you know, they're basically cleansing and purging themselves. Yeah. But uh, this is basically uh, God's sending them to make these people aware that they're following the wrong guy um, and that they're sort of like you could say missionaries going into a hostile territory um, but they're they're basically are there to prove that the trash can or not the trash can man uh, but that, that Rendell flag is a, is a fraud and uh, that they're following the wrong person uh, and then you know of course God makes an example of Las Vegas so um, it's yeah. it's a religious you know it's 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 an aspect of the book that um, you know I, I don't know how that's going to translate with modern audiences like the you know the religious aspects of this but you have to you have to remember that this is like the, these people are have all gone through a horrific um, cataclysm 
and I, you know, when you're, it's kind of like, you know, in the middle of the day, you, you say you don't believe in monsters, but when you're by yourself in the middle of the night and it's kind of scary or something like that, you, you can believe in things like that more. And I, I think under these circumstances, this whole religious aspect of the, of the film actually makes kind of a sense, you know, like people would turn back to these things because, you know, they, they're scared. And, um, so the power, the power of those kind of, uh, of that kind of themes, um, I think makes sense. Um, but yeah. I don't know, we've, we've become so cynical nowadays. I don't know how well that <laughs> will translate. I mean, you know, like when, even when like Darabont made the miss, um, and we had the one lady that was like the religious fanatic, it, the actors played it well, but the problem is it's sort of become a cliche now, even though, yeah. you know, yeah. oddly King was, when King wrote it, it wasn't, uh, originally, but now it's become like, you know, the religious fanatic is always evil and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, but it, it, it. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it felt a little bit. Uh, uh, Contrived. Wasted. Yeah, wasted because uh, you send them uh, there to tell them that you are following the right, wrong guy, and when they learned that, they they were dead. <laughs> well, some uh, some people got. Well, maybe I. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think most of them yeah. must have died. Since they should have. Yeah. But, blown an atomic bomb in the middle but, of them. But uh, so. I guess that's why. Um, Stu was behind to see it, right? So he's he, yeah, it, yeah. It, it just takes one person to say what happened. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I guess, so, but I I felt that it it felt very unnecessary to send them there by God, mm -hmm. uh, because at first I thought, oh, they were there to, so that everyone would be together when the bomb went off, because they were yeah. at the uh, center of the street there because they want to see them die. So, but I mean. It, after all, it was an atomic bomb, so everyone would have died anyway if, if yeah. they were in the near well, I, Las Vegas. So, well, the other th the other thing that I didn't mention that I, I think it plays a part to this is that uh, you know, like with Mother Abigail, when she went you know, out into uh, the wilderness for a while, I think the reason that these guys were sent there is because they are paying the penance or the price of their pride. And the fact that they were trying to basically recreate everything that caused this problem in the first place and that they hadn't learned their lesson. So that, that's another part of it. And like it's a, it's a harsh lesson, lesson. but uh, yeah. I pick up the pride issue, the whole pride theme is uh, re the other reason why he sent them there. So. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. And I, and I think it's more explained in the book. Yeah. Here in the movie, it, it, it lo got lost somehow, I think, in, in the translation yeah. Uh, why they went there? Uh, yeah. At least on, on me it did. Okay. Um, I I generally liked the uh, and as you mentioned off the top, I, I I do like the structure of the miniseries. They did a really good job of um, establishing a lot of these characters, even though there was you know they obviously compressed a lot of things. Um, and it's amazing, like 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 you. I haven't read the the book in a while, but I really started. Uh, I really knew who these characters were, even though I haven't read the book for a while. I, as soon as they said their names, yeah. I was, okay, that's the person that this is his story arc and that. So all of that came back to me really quickly. And um, you know, there's some really strong actors in here. I thought Gary Sinise was excellent as Stu Redman. Um, yeah, I, I it was great to see Ray Walston, who I grew up with. You know, my favorite Martian. Um, so he played Glenn Bateman and Rob Lowe, um, at the time I thought, wow, that's a really weird pick to play Nick Andros, but he does a really good job. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just so sad this, when you see him in the Salem slot remake, because, <laughs> uh, actually he's pretty good yeah. here. Uh, Miguel Ferrer, who of course, uh, did later on did night flyer. He's really good. Um, yeah. One of the standouts for me is Matt Fuhrer as the trash can man. I yeah. thought he was just fantastic. I think I think he was best in the in the entire series, actually. Yeah, I, I think he's one of my favorite characters. Um, and actually, you know, like Laura San Giacomo, I liked her, but I just hated her hair. <laughs> it, it was like a, it, it was a, obviously a wig, but it just was really distracting. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's. There's a, this is a really strong cast when you look back on it now um, at the time. And there's moments where uh, – and the guy that played Tom Cullen, who I can't remember his name, but he was like on, on a the coach sitcom. He played uh, somebody there. He Oh, Bill Fager. Fager Baker? Fager, Fager Baker, yeah. He, yeah. I thought he did an excellent job as well. Um, 
And uh, there was uh, a couple of times uh, I, ha I hadn't realized there was a couple of cameos in here. Uh, one was distracting, and that was the prophet guy. Do you know? Do you recognize that guy, the big, tall, black guy? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. He's like that's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, basketball player. Um, ah, okay. So he was distracting, but then there was like a couple of directors. Um, Sam Raimi was in there. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Uh, John Landis. Yeah. Uh, Mick Garris was in a couple of scenes uh, himself. Yes. Uh, his wife played Susan Stern. Uh, I think I think uh, his wife is in every of his movies. I think so. Yeah, because she was in the Shining yeah. series too. Uh, yeah. I thought she did a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, but, Stephen uh, King was in there. Yeah, and he he was okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Ozzy Davis, he, you know, is the judge. Um, Tom Holland. Tom Holland. Who did he play? Uh, Carl Hughes. H Hughes. Carl Huff. Carl Huff. Huff. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything else? And there were some guys like you know, one guy was uh, played the father in Elf. Um, another guy I've seen him in other stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I think but, there were uh, were a lot of of people you recognized yeah. uh, in there uh, who's been having uh, the these small parts in in a lot of lot of stuff. Yeah. That. You have seen them and you recognize them, but you can't really put their finger on put the finger on where you've seen them. So, yeah. so uh, oh, we, we can't forget uh, Kathy Bates was in there. Yes, yeah, and Ed Harris so, you, and Ed Harris, yeah, yeah. He was uh, he was kind of over the top, but I think his part yeah. demanded that. So he's got that intensity, right? So he, he kind of sells it, but um, yeah, uh, yeah. And I think I think uh, when you mention it that. Uh, a lot of, of the acting was a little bit over the top, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think that was just the way it was done yeah. in, in, in that time frame. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I, yeah. I don't think that anyone thought that it was over the top back no. then. No, But no. you look at it 20 years later, it, it feels that they are, uh, as you say, they are saying each other's names and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They are over-exaggerating the acting as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a style of that time period. It's kind of like when you watch original Star Trek, you know, how it's very uh, hammy too at times. But that's just the way they acted back yeah. then. I, yeah. I think the most interesting casting choice um, that I struggle with, because I do think he gives a good performance, but I, I do think it's Jamie Sheridan as Randall Flagg. Um, yeah. I'm not, and it's not just the hair, and maybe it's because some of the, the you know, the transformation special effects were kind of uh, cheesy, but lame. <laughs> yeah, you know, okay, you can say that too. Um, but, at, but you know, he did have a swagger about him that I did like. But um, I, I think the the asp one aspect of, um, from the book that was lost is when he started to lose control of the situations. Um, yeah. And these people would start to, you know, get slipped through his fingers and whatnot. I, I don't think, uh, I didn't get the feeling that they showed that loss of power um, properly. But I, I, did, I do yeah. like the scenes where, uh, you know, he would transform back from the crow and he, had, like, he would still have like a feather or two in his hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was yep. clever. And the first time they show yeah. him, like when that's a crow sitting on the top of the, the telephone pole, um, yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, and I think I think he, he was he was the walking dude with yeah. the jeans and the cowboy boots and the jeans yeah. jacket. So I think that worked. But as you say, uh, he the transformations were, was really outdated, and yeah. I think the way he looked, it it just looked strange. It wasn't really scary. It just looked looked like a yeah, uh, I, I don't know a bull or something that had been run over, yeah. and uh, <laughs> so it yeah. looked very strange. But yeah, um, and, and another thing that's dated too, and and King has come under criticism. This is how he uses black characters to be like magical, um, you know, magical beings yeah. and that. But I have to say that I thought Ruby D as Mother Abigail Fremantle did a good job. I mean, for the way the character was written. Um, and sometimes, you know, it might be a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason because it it works. And I, I thought her performance overall was pretty good in this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think that they 
maybe maybe they should have toned down the supernatural things a little bit uh, mm. to make it more realistic. Um, yeah, well, you know, you got to kind of sell that. But I, again, part of the problem there is the you know the, some of the practical effects just don't work, and you, yeah, you're better yeah. off leaving some of that stuff to the to the to the viewer's imagination. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and if if you look, it's totally different. But if you compare it to like, uh, uh, say, The Walking Dead, and right. if you if you would take The Walking Dead and remove all the zombies and just look at how the world uh, there looks when it's mm -hmm. it's going to uh, to hell, <laughs> yeah. it, it it looks a lot more cleaner here in the stand, and it, it would have <laughs> I, I would have liked it to be a little bit more dirty, a little bit more, yeah. Uh, I don't know the exact what it's called, but more uh, falling apart. Yeah, it looks more too decrepit. clean here. I think. Yeah, yeah it looks looks too clean here. Yeah, uh, and I guess that's also because it's twenty years old. Yeah, uh, and that's one. a budget restriction because. Yeah, you know, exactly. So I think if if yeah. they were done do it today, modern technique, and I think it would be a lot more uh, realistic. Yeah, I um. I had a curious reaction too with the uh, Hemingway home set. I mean, it looked obviously like it was in, done inside a studio, but it also, again, that's because it was it felt organic and raw. It it had this kind of retro charm to it. It almost made me felt like they were on the set of Wizard of the Oz, uh, Wizard of Oz, like the old nineteen thirty nine movie. Every time they went yeah. back to that house, I felt like. Uh, Dorothy would just come out of the front door or something like that. It had that feel to it. So, yeah, it, yeah. you know, it, it was kind of, it was, it was dated, but it, it didn't bother me. It was, I, I actually found it kind of charming. And this is the thing, like, you know, you and me, we, we grew up with the book and we've watched this mini series when it premiered. It's kind of like with the, the you know, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. When I watched that, that movie scared the crap out of me. When my son watched it, he thought it was hilarious because he said the special effects were so lame. But I, yeah. I, I still think it's, and I can't, <laughs> even though I can see that, because, you know, I'm, I guess I'm stuck with these rose-colored glasses because I grew up with it. I can't, I can't divorce myself from that mindset. And I know if... If I showed the series to my son, he would probably fall asleep. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I really, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I was surprised. It, it, yeah, it's dated, but it, there's some, there's a certain charm about it, and a, a lot of things work properly. Um, the structure, the music, uh, that opening scene just really hooks you. Um, yeah. But then there's little things like you know when the car crashes into the gas pumps and that, then it kind of takes you out of it because it just looks kind of lame. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and, and and the lack of cell phones and computers and all that kind of stuff that that really yeah is something that you have to kind of wrap your head around too. But uh, I mean, once the you know once the stuff goes down, cell phones would probably wouldn't work anymore anyhow. But uh, it's just like not seeing computers and stuff like that. <laughs> it was kind of yeah, 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 and I, I mean, it's you have to look at it as it it's it was done twenty years ago, so it's not strange that it feels outdated because it was yeah. done in in that time frame, and and uh, I think I I still think it's a, a good adaptation uh, yeah. because they are are they feel true to the book. Yes, uh, and then that the fashion and. The computers and stuff has has changed. That yep. you can never, you can't, you can't uh, uh, calculate on that in no. advance. So no. I have to. I think you have to forgive that when you when you watch it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, but it would be interesting to hear if there are uh, people listening to us that hasn't seen this before mm -hmm. and uh, watch it for the first time. It would be very very interesting to hear what you think about it if it. As you say, if if you like your sons, fall asleep to it, or if you <laughs> think it's pretty good anyway, yeah, uh, it, it would be interesting to hear from you. Yeah, one one thing I have to say that I I never really bought, but I think I actually it did kind of work better for me this time was the special effects of the um, the hand grabbing the bomb at the at the yeah. end. That actually didn't bother me as much, but it was the actual like when he first threw the the fireball at that one guy that was um st trying to stand up to him. Uh yeah. that that looked fake. But then when the hand actually kind of formed and wrapped itself around the bomb and the bomb they they showed a couple of close-up shots and you could tell it was just like cardboard 
tubes stuck inside it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, you should have just kept long shots from that because that looks so fake. That bomb was just terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, Matt Frewer with that makeup, like his face, his skin was all melting and all that. He was yeah, so, that w- he was so yeah, good. Oh, That was great. Yeah, yeah he, he was so good in this. He was definitely the best uh, character and actor in, the, in this one, I think. Yeah. Definitely. Well, he had the he had the most fun part to play, you know. Yeah, exactly. He was just straight crazy from the beginning, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he just did everything bump to de bump, and then when he gets the nuclear missile, it goes bump to de bump. <laughs> <laughs> that was just so yep. awesome. <laughs> yeah, I really, uh, you know, if they do a remake, I think they could still cast him to do, to play the part again. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that that would be fun. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So. What what did you think about uh, Larry Underwood's hit, Baby, Can You Dig Your Man? <laughs> well, that's the problem. Like any time you have a fictional musician or, or a music group or something like that, the song, that it, it's, it's very rare that the song is actually something that you think would be good or catchy. Yeah. Um, I mean, like you get like, um, and it's not really the same thing, but like a show like The Greatest American Hero. Um, you know, believe it or not, I'm I'm floating on air, um, like I can fly, uh, like that. That that's a that was a hit on its own, and it, yeah. without that, like if you know if they had done like a, a version of Baby Can You Dig Your Man and released it to play on actual radio stations and that, um, then I think it works. But when it's a fictional song that you don't know, because music is so, like when you hear a song that you know, it just you know, it grabs you emotionally because you've got all these memories of it, right? Um, yeah. But when it's something like this, unless it's something really catchy, um, it it just sounded like overproduced elevator music yeah. to me. So it didn't. Yeah. But and it's such a big part of the book, right? Because. Uh, yeah, I wonder if if King himself wrote those lines. I oh, I'm sure he did. he did. Oh, I'm sure. He yeah. Did. For sure. For sure. <laughs> um, well, so what else can we talk about here? I, I mean. I guess I'll just circle back to what we were talking. Like some people are saying, if they do redo the stand, uh, how can they make four movies? And here we have this miniseries yeah. with four episodes, about uh, ninety minutes each. And um, you know, there's stuff that they left out, but in general, they caught all the high points. And um, I, I. I appreciate that. I the I guess the other thing that dates us is the pace is slow. And I don't know yeah. if you can do that in a um, a modern adaptation. I guess you'd have to show uh, because they didn't show a lot of the actual breakdown. Um, you know, you got glimpses of it here and there, but like New York City was basically laid to waste when we pick up uh, um, Larry Underwood's story again. Yeah. So um, I think in the new version, it would probably concentrate a little bit more on that stuff, but. For me, that stuff has been done like so many times that I, I, what I would like to see them do is expand that tunnel sequence. Like, like that should be as scary as heck. Um, yeah. Which it wasn't. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, what might be a problem with with doing four or three movies of it is that this was done for TV, and you can you could sit at home, uh, you could you could invest time in in watching it, and didn't you, if you didn't like it, you could turn off uh, and. Um, you didn't have to to pay for it. It was on 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 regular TV. Uh, I think the the problem with doing four movies is that uh, if they start doing one movie and uh, it 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 doesn't go well, they might not continue, uh, and people might miss out, and you would have to pay for it. And I think so. So I think more that uh, it it might be harder to get people to invest time and money to go to the theater and see four movies that's released like maybe uh, if if it's something like the uh, Lord of the Rings uh, mm-hmm. once a year instead yeah. of like here you have four episodes that's released uh, I think they were released like in a week's time or something like that so I think it's more the format of how it was released that might be a problem than actually filling the time with with stuff mm-hmm. on the, on the plus side um, you know, post-apocalyptic movies are really big right now. So it, yeah, it definitely yeah. has that going for it. Um, you know, the strategy I, I would see with the movies is they would film the first one. And, um, you know, once they see the box office returns, like on opening weekend, if, if it, you know, if it does what they think it's going to do, 
uh, or it hits the numbers that they're hoping for, then you would just you would basically film the next three all at the same time, um, cut yeah. down your costs, and uh, that way you can release one every year. Which, like I agree with you, once they get the first one out, they basically have to release the next installment the following yeah. year. Like they can't take two year, two three years off between installments. You need to keep that momentum going, and people will remember the movie, and that that would that would work. But if it's like two or three years between each movie, then that, yeah, that would be an issue. Yeah, yeah, but I think I, I think uh, I I get impatient when when I have to wait like a year to the next movie. Well, uh, as they do with many, so I would prefer to have it as a TV show where I can see it and finish it in in like a week or maybe four weeks if they do it once a week. So yeah. I would definitely see it either way, mm-hmm. uh, depend, not depending on how it's released. But I I can see how a lot of people would prefer to have it. They know it's all done. I yep. you know it's going to be released in a pretty short time period instead of having one and maybe the others. And if the others are done, they won't know how it ends like in in four years. Yep. It's it's a lot of time to invest in, in stuff like that. And and uh, so I, I, can, I can definitely see a, a worry there in, in the, sure. the way it's released. Yeah. But, the, you know, the, I think out of all the properties that they're trying to, to adapt, uh, I think the stand is got the best commercial possibilities because of its its nature whereas the, the dark tower i think is going to be a harder sell but yeah. uh, i know studios are looking for franchises right now and like you know they want that you know that next harry potter seven movie thing or the hunger games or whatever um you know yeah um but we'll have to see uh right now because of where josh boone is with uh the revival the you know this is this has been pushed back at least two 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 years if if not more yeah for probably more like yeah. four um so yeah i don't think we'll see if if it's done i don't think we will see the first movie out until maybe 2018 yeah if we're lucky yeah. yeah 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 i think that's the earliest if it's done yeah and now <laughs> for myself now that i'm st- i'm almost pushing 60 you know when these you get these <laughs> kind of delays you're kind of going Come on, guys! I want to see this before I, I'm not around yep, anymore. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why I like with the Dark Tower and that. I don't know if I'll ever get to see the whole thing. Probably not. But uh, yeah, well, which is why well, that, why like you, the idea of a mini series is more attractive because it would get all out in the same year. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, today as well, they can do a uh, earlier, like like in in twenty years ago. Uh, a TV series were, were always a, a, a kind of lamer version of a TV sh- uh, movie. Yeah. Uh, everything looked cheaper. Every every effect was was not as good as a, in a movie. Yeah. But I mean today today a TV show can often be, be maybe even good better or at least as good as a as a movie. Yeah. So you don't have that, to, have that problem anymore. Yeah. The gap between the two is definitely getting narrower. Yeah. Yeah. So. Why not go go for a TV show and have it have it done? Yeah, like the, like yeah, 11, 22, 63, 63. Yep. you'll have it in in eight weeks and yep. it's all there. Yeah, yeah, I I, I, I I can see that. I I mean the the only thing is with the TV show, like the gap is definitely smaller, but you, the scale will be still not um, movie quality uh, from a yeah. techni- from a technical perspective. But yeah. Uh, yeah, and I mean, you, you know, have you have shows like Game of Thrones today. I mean, if yeah, if, if yeah. they get the same budget and same uh, good people that do the effects there, give yeah. them the stand, then I'm sure they could do a good job with it. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, the more you talk about that, the more I, I I agree with it. I I think TV is a better format, especially well, it's not necessarily TV for as we traditionally think of it, but. Um, any sort of media streaming service, Hulu, Netflix, whatever, I, yeah. I think that's the better ideal platform for for these kinds of works because they they are so long, um, and that the fact that you know it's not the same amount of censorship now um, that it was back then as well. So you can show be a little more adult in the in the and graphic with the with the uh, uh, you know the 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 horror and the and the gore yeah. and things like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I think the only problem with if they if they do a, a TV series of it is that they might continue too long, like they did with Under the Dome. 
Yeah. Or the walking so dead. That, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a shot. Just taking yep. a little shot at you. Um, yep. Uh, so I think that that might be a problem. But if they do, like Hulu has, as far as I know, no plans on doing a, a season two of eleven twenty two sixty three. It's a contained eight part series, and they're done with it. So mm-hmm. if they do it like that, I, I'm all for a TV series more than several movies actually. Yeah, yeah, and you just have to wonder if they will maybe touch upon some of the things that were cut out of the original edition of the stand. Though I don't think it's that that material is really needed, but it would be interesting just you know if they're doing an alternative adaptation of it, if they would uh, include some of that material as well. But yeah, yeah, and if they feel they need more material, they have a lot to to go go with there as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, and it and it could have a lot of fun with it. You know, you could maybe uh, drum up interest with it because there's like even like the miniseries did. You can get so many cameos because there's so many characters that come in and have like a scene or two, and then they're done, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah that would be kind of cool. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, uh, this this book is uh, arguably, and well, I think for, according to the polls that you've run, this is like the runaway all-time favorite book of a lot of Stephen King fans. It gets yeah. more than double yeah. the votes of uh, it, right? I think. Yeah, I think it, it did. It, yeah. It's definitely number one. Yeah. And while I appreciate it because of the scale and how he handles so many characters and makes so many characters come to life, it's not my favorite book of his. Um, uh, I actually like something smaller like The Dead Zone or something like that. Um, I just really appreciate the cleverness of that and the uh, you know, you're you're much more into that one character, but it it is this is an amazing book to for him to create so many characters um, that you know I I can instantly call them up in my mind and who they are, and that's just amazing. Yeah. You know, he just it's a it's you know it's his showcase piece of work for creating so many memorable characters, um, and. It also kind of highlights the fact that he writes endings that a lot of people don't think uh, live up to the initial promise. But uh, I don't know. It's it, it worked for me, uh, and uh, I just uh, really liked just listening to the soundtrack of this movie for a lot of <laughs> lot, lot, that got Ry Cooter guitar, sliding guitar, bluesy stuff. Just worked worked really good for me. So yeah, yeah, I think it's great. So, uh, do you recommend this to other King fans out there? Absolutely. It's probably, I'm trying to think now, is this the number one Stephen King adaptation? Like, if we're not talking movies, but TV shows, miniseries, I would say it probably, yeah, it's 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 got to be the number one TV adaptation. I, but I'm trying to think of the other ones, and I can't really th- remember too many of them now. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah. Uh, uh, what else did we have? Uh, we under, have um, under the dome see. haven. Oh, the dead zone was good for the first four seasons. Um, yeah, different format. Um, I don't. How many other miniseries did they do? I can't. Well, if you're counting those, were just a few episodes. You have Salem's Lot. Oh, uh, Salem's Lot. Ye- yes. Golden Years. Yeah. It. Tommy Knockers. Uh, Years. Yeah, <laughs> The Shining. <laughs> yeah. So Storm of the Century. Oh, Storm of the Century is really good. Yeah, yeah. Rose Red. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan of that one. Yeah. So I, Kingdom I, I, Hospital. Yeah, Kingdom Hospital was okay. Um, yeah. Parts of it were good. Other parts I didn't like too much. So uh, for me, it would be uh, a toss up between the stand. Um. Shoot, you mentioned the other ones again. Now I can't remember. Um, <laughs> Golden Years, It, Salem's Lot. Salem's Lot. And I think there was one more. Oh. Uh, uh, Rose Red. No. Storm of the Century. Storm of the Century. Those Shining. Are the three. Yeah, those three. Yeah. yeah. Storm of the Century, The Stand, and Salem's Lot. And... Um, I think this uh, Storm of Century has the advantage of being created uh, initially for TV. So yeah. that, that that one you go into with no expectations. And I 
I generally like that one. Salem's Lot, of course, holds a, a special place in my heart. Um, especially like the window tapping scene. Like, you know, I don't think I'll ever yeah. get that yeah. out of my system. <laughs> 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 and just the way they did that special effects. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, really, on on the scale of everything that's done, I, I think you have to give it to the stand. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, I have to put eleven twenty two sixty three up there as well. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. I'm hoping no. for, but that's good to hear, though. Yeah. Yep. I. I um, well, I won't say too much, but I like it. Good. Good. Yep. We'll that's be good. talking more about that in the. Uh, upcoming episodes and the first episode is out tomorrow so Yay. can't wait see it? Do, you, do you have hulu uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> good <laughs> i have my ways <laughs> let's put it that yep. way yeah <laughs> um but yeah i'm looking forward to seeing it uh, and tomorrow's uh family day here in um canada which means we have a day off tomorrow a uh, long weekend so ah, but i think we might okay. be going to see deadpool so We'll have to see. <laughs> yeah. Put the family in front of 11, 22, 63 then. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they'll watch it, but uh, we'll, we'll give it a shot. See what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You got anything else you want to add? Uh, anything about the Stephen King revisited stuff? Um, you know, Bev gives some great historical context there again. And yeah. um, I think Richard and Josh both do uh, provide some very interesting insights as to where the at the time potential stand adaptation was kind of going to be so um we'll put links up on the uh, show notes for this but yes. i definitely recommend that you check them out and i was again i was pleasantly surprised by my revisit of this um, maybe it just caught me in a good mood but um you know when a when a, a, uh, a show has a really strong opening that really hooks you and the stand yeah. definitely does that really works um that yes. really carries a long way for me so yeah, and I think we we want to hear hear what you say about them, uh, what you think about this as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, give us a comment to it, mm -hmm. especially if you haven't seen it before and see it for the first time. This yeah, uh, on our eyes. recommendation. Yeah, we have yep. old eyes. We need some fresh eyes perspectives. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> My eyes are older than yours, Han, but uh, you know what I yeah. mean. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so okay. that wraps up this uh, installment, and yes. you want to take us out for our next couple of podcasts? <laughs> sure. Um, for the next uh, podcast, who isn't really our podcast, we will, as we mentioned, be. Uh, visiting the book versus movie uh, podcast, and we will be talking about the first two episodes of Eleven Twenty Two Sixty Three. The first one is called The Rabbit Hole, and the other The Killing Floor. Mm. Uh, so we will be talking about those, and um, for the next ep episode of our own uh, podcast, uh, we haven't really discussed exactly what we're going to talk about but we will definitely talk about 11 22 63 and the episodes that have aired uh, by that time so make sure you stay updated to what happens with them mm -hmm. uh, so you can join in and comment on them yeah if nothing else the next book in the stephen king revisited uh, website is the long walk which ah is a good one uh, it's a good one. It's my, yeah. one of my favorite books. Of yes, King. Mr. Darabond, yeah. what are you doing? Let's get going on this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Drop everything yeah. else. Do this. Yep. Yep. But until then, stay safe. But stay scared. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>